Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part four of evaluation of the small bowel. We're looking at everything you need to know about small bowel obstruction. And last time I mentioned about intersusceptions, we spoke about one of the causes, the third most common cause of small bowel obstruction is tumors. It can be malignant tumors or benign. Intersusception in general, often malignant tumors, but more commonly in adults, benign tumors in the small bowel. Malignant anywhere from adenocarcinoma to lymphoma to metastasis, also just tumors. Of course, intersusception can be due to functional causes like celiac disease or Crohn's disease. We talk about benign causes like Meckel's or cystic fibrosis. And of course, tumors in Poots Jaeger's, inflammatory polyps or lipomas are all things that can cause intersusception. Statistically, malignant tumors cause 30% of intersusceptions in the small bowel and over 50% in the large bowel, with adenocarcinoma being the most common pathology of small bowel intersusceptions, though I do think metastasis is increasing in numbers. And we mentioned other malignant causes include lymphoma, sarcomas, like GIST tumors, and metastasis. And metastasis to small bowel occur in melanoma, as well as lung cancer, breast cancer, and renal cell carcinoma. Just a few examples, a really classic cross-sectional appearance of an intersusception. You can see the fat, the vessels being pulled, and then you really appreciate it. There's the lead point on the coronal views with 3D rendering. It's important to recognize the appearances. I think you can routinely easily diagnose them on axial images, but then get more information from the coronals, whether it's a simple coronal or in this case, a volume rendered coronal. You can see the stretching of vessels where the tumor is pulled into the small bowel. There's the fat, there's the tract, classic intersusception, very nicely shown as well on the cinematic rendering. And here as well, look at that intersusception being pulled in, very nicely shown there, a really nice example. Another case, this is a patient with a classic axial imaging intersusception. There's dilated small bowel proximally. There's that classic appearance with the fat in the center because of the, the way it pulls the fat and the vessels into it. You can see it here very nicely, the dilated loops of bowel. You then track this upward. And right here is the intersusception. Now, I will comment that uh, we have discussed in the past that Patients do get incidental jejunal intersusceptions due to no particular cause, and they're intermittent, and they don't cause obstruction. But when you see obstruction like this, dilated bowel, you know that intersusception is not just one of those intermittent intersusceptions. And you can see it here very nicely as well. You can see the stretching of the vessel and the kind of loop appearance of the intersusception and the proximal bowel that is indeed uh, dilated. And again, beautifully shown in this example on the cinematic rendered views. I like the cinematic rendering for the volume projections and really gives you a good feel. I think cinematic will be used more in the future as it becomes more of a standard, but beautiful look at the fold pattern and the intersusception right there, very nicely shown. Another case, a patient presents, uh, um, well, it's the same case, a patient presented with acute abdomen. So this was just a great example of that small bowel tumor, but again, it was not suspected. I think one of the things, it's rare when someone says roulette intersusception, it's more the patient's presenting with an acute abdomen. And so with that acute abdomen, you'll go through the tumor and see the extent of tumor involvement. So I just wanted to show you this again. Again, think about the dilated bowel, think about the transition, Look at the mesenteric vessels, how the branches off the SMA are stretched, because remember, the intersusception pulls in. It's kind of a telescoping type appearance. And with the telescoping, you get some of the fat pulled, be pulling in, surrounding the loop of bowel, and as well as the vessels. So again, I want you to look and think about this, okay? So I showed you that case two times to really think about it once, then look at it a second time and really uh, note that this was a beautiful intersusception due to metastatic lung cancer. And as I mentioned, adenocarcinoma is classically number one intersusceptions for malignant causes, 
but I think metastasis for melanoma, lung cancer, and the like are really pushing uh, METs to the top of the list. Here's another patient, intussusception in the left lower quadrant, dilated bowel loops, abdominal pain, there's the intussusception, there's the fat. This was a one centimeter benign fibrous polyp. I think in terms of can you distinguish malignant from benign, if the only process you're seeing is the intussusception, the answer is probably not. Obviously, if the patient has lymphoma and then has extensive nodes or metastasis to the liver and then it's an adenocarcinoma, that's easy. But what we can say here is we see no reason for malignancy, though we could not exclude it. This patient had surgery, the tumor was resected, some bowel was resected, and the patient did fine. And beautifully shown on the coronal views as well, uh, a really good look at that patient's intussusception. And here's just a few more appearances showing that very nicely as well. And again, here's the same patient, cinematic rendering. Let me just go back. And there it is really nicely shown right here. Now I mentioned, of course, when you have uh, intussusceptions, benign causes are not uncommon. And the easiest one to recognize is a lipoma. Here's a patient with suspected small bowel obstruction, patient presented with nausea and vomiting. There's the dilated loops of small bowel. There's the intussusception, but you can see the fat. That's not the fat being pulled in. That's the fatty tumor. And so intussusceptions, caused by lipomas are not uncommon. Remember, lipomas of the small bowel never become malignant. They don't become liposarcomas, but they can cause bleeding, and so they can present with GI bleed, or they can cause intussusception, as was the case here, very nicely shown on the 3D volume rendering as well. Okay, a really good look at that. Again, another patient, intussusception, lipoma. Another patient, adenocarcinoma of the small bowel, with a dilatation, again, obstruction. Here's the patient's tumor right here as well. So one of the things, again, in this case, this patient had an intussusception that was intermittent, but we follow the dilated loops of bowel downward, and then you see the transition in the left lower quadrant, and you see the mass. Again, I think the mass is very obvious on the axial. It's much more obvious, perhaps, on the coronal, as you follow the transition downward. So just a really, really nice appearance of an intus, of a uh, infiltrating tumor. And this tumor led to intermittent intussusceptions as well, beautifully shown on the cinematic rendering right there. So a uh, particularly nice example of small bowel obstruction due to malignancy. And again, uh, I think the cinematic really accentuates the tumor. But I think from the axial images and the coronal, you would have had no problem making the diagnosis. This patient presented with right lower quadrant pain, and what do you see? You see dilated loops of small bowel, and you see a mass in the region of the cecum. You can go through possibilities. Is this a cecal tumor, like an adenocarcinoma? Could this be lymphoma causing obstruction? Could this be maybe a pseudomass? In a sense, could the patient have appendiceal abscess with a big mass present? Meckel's diverticulum you would consider, but it doesn't really look like a Meckel's. Um, again, I think always think about lymphoma, bulky tumor. Could it be a, a process arising in the ileum, terminal ileum, like lymphoma or even metastasis or adenocarcinoma, extending to and involving the patient's cecum? But I think at the end of the day, what you really can describe here is small bowel obstruction, and there's a mass in the right lower quadrant. Epicenter tends to be the cecum. We looked a little bit higher in this patient, then you can see nodes surrounding the patient's aorta, subcrural regions, encasement around the patient's celiac, tumor extending near the patient's pancreas, and multiple lesions in the spleen. So now you have vessel encasement, you have periportal adenopathy, subcrural nodes, peripancreatic nodes, and multiple splenic lesions. And that made it a bit easier because now instead of thinking about an adenocarcinoma, which maybe is more common, but adenocarcinoma could give you some of those nodal spreads, but it's not going to give you splenic lesions. When you see a small bowel or a large bowel tumor and you see spleen, you got to be thinking about lymphoma. And this is a great example of where the patient's lymphoma was primary or originated in the cecum, but then involved the terminal ileum, which is not uncommon. 
but nevertheless caused obstruction. Another patient, abdominal distension. What's the cause of this obstruction? The stomach is markedly distended. We still could be dealing with an ulcer in the duodenum or some other inflammatory process or even a tumor in the duodenum. We can even be dealing with potentially pancreatic cancer involving the duodenum. As we scan lower in this patient, we see lots of dilated bowel loops, but the other thing we see is pneumatosis. Now, this is not just subtle pneumatosis in terms of air in a patient where it's benign pneumatosis. This is extensive, multiple loops of small bowel. Again, the air in the dependent and non-dependent portions of the bowel. When you see this much pneumatosis and bowel obstruction, you have bowel obstruction with ischemic and infarcted bowel, and this patient's survival is not likely. Now, just because you have pneumatosis, and you have infarcted bowel, you can survive with very aggressive management. But this patient's bowel was just too many loops were infarcted and the patient was unable to be saved. You also can see the small vessels. You also can see as we scan down to the pelvis, really the extent of the patient's pneumatosis and bowel infarction. So one of the things with small bowel we look at, and of course there really were some complication, is infarction of bowel. That's why when you see pneumatosis, if you see it, you better pick it up early. When you pick up pneumatosis late, the patient's chance at survival is really decreased. This is really impressive infarcted bowel, where most of the small bowel, unfortunately, is infarcted. If you looked at the MIP images, look at the size of the mesenteric vessels. Look how small the SMA is and look how the branches, the ileocolic branches, the genital branches are all tapered. That's a very good sign of hypotension. Poor flow to the bowel now. Is it poor flow and that's why it's infarcted or it's infarcted and then you have poor flow? It's obviously poor flow and then infarction, but it's a spectrum of findings. Sometimes you'll see very tiny vessels and no evidence of pneumatosis, but then I have to say I'm worried about ischemic changes developing because of the patient's small caliber vessels. And here's eventually some of the images of the upper abdomen, the classic appearance of air in the hepatic veins and portal veins, meaning the bowel is infarcted. Just a classic, classic unfortunate case. And again, take a careful look at this case. This is how the patient presented. There wasn't much we can do about it. Uh, this patient uh, was in a nursing home and so presented late perhaps, but infarcted bowel, ischemic bowel, air in the portal venous system, hepatic veins, as well as infarction. And here it is impressively shown on the patient's cinematic rendering with the pneumatosis. Here it is again, very impressive pneumatosis. So just an impressive case of infarction. Now, one of the things we also look at, if we're looking at small bowel, we often do dedicated small bowel studies, which are called CT enterography. And in Crohn's disease, we look for many things. We look for mucosal hyperenhancement, we look for wall thickening, we look for the comb sign with a prominent vasorecta, we look for mesenteric fat stranding, we look for changes in the vessel caliber, all sorts of different findings we'll look at. And here's a good example of dilated bowel with an enterolith. Remember, one of the complications of Crohn's, when you think about small bowel obstruction, is these strictures. And with these strictures, like you can see here beautifully, there's an enterolith, but there's that thickened bowel. Now, one comment I will make with Crohn's, patients with Crohn's have an increased incidence of adenocarcinoma. And at times it's hard to differentiate adenocarcinoma arising in a Crohn's patient unless it's really markedly thickened and often the thickening is asymmetric. But here's just a beautiful example of Crohn's disease with wall thickening. Another case in terms of bowel obstruction, look at the duodenum, look how dilated it is. Look at the stricture in the third portion of the duodenum. There's another stricture in the ileum where the patient also has proximal bowel dilatation. This makes the point and emphasizes you need to look very carefully. If you see one stricture, one area of obstruction, keep looking because patients may have multiple obstructions present. And that's probably the most impressive duodenal stricture I've seen in a Crohn's patient. It also makes the point that in Crohn's patients, we look for the ileum, but you need to look at the entire bowel, including the proximal bowel, because the duodenum is not uncommonly involved. In this case, a wonderful example of that. Here's a cinematic rendering.
Very nice uh, display of those findings. Another example of a patient with dilated bowel presenting with obstruction, history of Crohn's. Look at the loops of bowel over 7.5 centimeters dilated. We track it downward as we get toward the terminal ileum. You can see thickening. And you see it here, a long segment of thickening. And because of that, in the marked distension, this was resected. Now, to me, this looks like a stricture, a classic stricture of Crohn's disease, which is what it looked like to the surgeon. Unfortunately, the pathologist, when after looking, found a few days later that the patient had areas of adenocarcinoma within the patient's area of stricturing. I mentioned if the stricturing is asymmetric, if there's a mass present, you can suggest tumor, and the surgeons will look around and get some frozen sections. Remember, if they worried about a tumor being present, they would do a nodal dissection. If there's no suspicion of tumor, they're not going to do a nodal dissection. They're just going to go in and resect the bowel, which was the case here. So there's no way, even in retrospect, I would have called this a tumor. Now, CT enterography in Crohn's patients, whether it's evaluating for obstruction or other causes, has a very high sensitivity, very cost-effective. Now, there are other things in terms of non-neoplastic but inflammatory diseases that cause small bowel obstruction. And let's do this. Let's stop here and come back for part five. I don't think we've ever done a five-parter before, but this will be a five-parter. Let's come back in a few minutes, do the fifth and final part, and I'll see you then. Bye. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.